Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon to those in different time zones. Uh, my name is Jordan, and welcome to another episode of Explorer Classroom. I'm here calling from National Geographic's headquarters in Washington, D.C., and we are so excited to have Bob Poole with us today. Um, he's a wildlife cinematographer. He's done a lot of work supporting different National Geographic projects throughout his career, and there's lots of stuff out there to talk about and really dive into today. So I'm happy and thankful that all of you are able to join us. For those of you who are watching on our YouTube, that are not in our Google Hangout, but are watching from YouTube Live, um, please use the hashtag Let's Explore on Twitter, or just type into the sidebar on YouTube Live, and we can bring your questions into the conversation. Um, thanks so much for joining. I'll pass on to our host, Joe. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, Jordan. Uh, as Jordan mentioned, my name's Joe. I'll be your host today. I'm a teacher in Guelph, uh, Ontario. Very excited to welcome uh, Bob today. Bob grew up in East Africa. His relationship uh, with Nat Geo started as a teenager when he worked on a crew uh, that came to Kenya to film elephants. Um, since then, he's traveled, or he's, he went from there traveling the world as a camera assistant before landing his first uh, gig as a cinematographer for Nat Geo. It was a film called Coming of Age with Elephants. Uh, uh, it's actually featuring his sister, uh, Dr. Joyce Poole. Um, he's now an Emmy Award winning director of photography. His films, he films people, and wildlife around the world. He's now moved in front of the camera as well. He's got an extensive list of credits uh, from Nature to BBC to Discovery, as well as uh, over 35 uh, Nat Geo uh, shows. So Bob, it's great to have you joining us for a hangout today. Quite an amazing setup you've got going here, talking to people all over the place. It's not. It's not bad, it's not bad at all. So we have classrooms joining us in Canada and the US today. And then I'm just watching our numbers slowly climb as the YouTube viewers uh, join in live from various spots to catch the hangout. Cool, great, great. Are you still there? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me okay? All right, good. I hear you fine, yes. All right, well we're excited. Sure. I've had a sneak peek of your presentation, so I'm, I'm really excited for you to share a little bit about uh, your work around the world with students. Get started with it. Are you guys ready Absolutely. or do you want to wait? Okay, well I've got it here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, hopefully that works out well. And uh, can you see my screen now? We can, it just loaded up. All right, well, it's, I'm going to call this wildlife cinematography, and I'll get started. You heard a little bit already about my background, but I moved to Africa with my parents when I was three years old. That's me on the spare tire of the Land Rover there with my father. Um, I grew up in Africa collecting snakes and lizards and all kinds of other pets. And um, my sisters and I, we got to know wildlife from a very early age. My older sister... When she got, got to be in her 20s, she um, started set, studying elephants, and she got to become one of the world's greatest elephant biologists, and she still does it today. She's really quite one of the world's leading expert on African elephant behavior. I became a cinematographer for National Geographic, and I traveled all over the world, but especially, especially in Africa. I went to the remote parts of Africa, and I'm going to talk about a couple of those um, today. But um, I'm still doing it. I started when I was 17 years old, and now I'm almost a really old man. And um, I'm still doing it, and I still love it. But my first uh, story I want to tell you about is a place that I went to a long time ago when I first went there was in 2008. Seems like a long time ago, doesn't it? But um, I went to this place in Mozambique. It's called Gorongosa National Park. And it's in a big country of Mozambique, um, and it's dead center. It's about a million acres of wilderness, this national park, surrounded by wilderness around its borders as well. And this park had been one of the greatest parks in all of Africa. And it was known for tremendous herds of buffalo and zebra and, and, and wildebeest. There were thousands of elephants and big prides of lions. But war broke out in the country, and a war for independence against their colonial... Um, uh, the, the Portuguese, and then a civil war. And during that time, almost all the wildlife in the park were killed. Well, when I first got there in 2008, there was almost no wildlife, but it was a really wild place and an, an amazing wildlife habitat. 
I was there to film for National Geographic, and I really fell in love with this park. Um, I was there making a film called Africa's Lost Eden, and it was about the restoration of bringing wildlife back to that park. One of the, one of the I mean, Gorongosa is fantastic elephant habitat. There used to be something like 4,000 elephants in the park, but sadly, so many of them were killed. About 95% of the elephants there were killed by soldiers uh, who were um, going after their, uh, their tusks, which they sold for, uh, they traded for guns and ammunition. And so the elephants there, many of them don't have tusks now because in, it's natural in African elephants that uh, some uh, elephants don't have tusks. And since they weren't valuable to the soldiers, those are the elephants that are left. So now there's about, normally in African elephants, there'll be about 3% of elephants without tusks. Now in Gorongosa, it's more like 30%. So the elephants there in Gorongosa, obviously, uh, being so heavily poached, they don't like people anymore. And they often charge and chase it at, at humans um, it, that are, say, driving vehicles around in the park or whatever. And that's, that's not very great because elephants are dangerous and, and people could get hurt. And so we went, we went there to film, and so filming, I had to actually be very careful filming elephants. I had to keep my distance uh, from them as much as possible, but sometimes they would come too close, and uh, it got scary. In fact, I had, I, I had built this Land Rover with these metal bars to try to protect me from these elephants, and it did actually save my life at one point. But um, my older sister, Joyce, who at that point had been about 35 years now studying elephants, and she came down to Gorongosa, um, and we, we worked together with these elephants. She was trying to understand their behavior, and I was trying to film them. We got to know a lot of family groups. You know, elephants live in families, just like us, and they're usually led by the oldest female in the family, and she's known as a matriarch. And unfortunately, you know, well, these elephant families live together for life. But in Gorongosa, since so many of the elephants were killed, there was a lot of orphans that came together to, film, to make their own families. But there, there were a few... I think there's a line through the camera, why? Can you guys hear me okay? Uh, yeah, Bob, we just had a classroom join. So, uh, okay, good. Go ahead. So I'm, I'm talking about um, elephant families right now and um, in, a, in a place where the... Uh, most of the elephants were killed, actually, and sadly, many of the families um, came. To, many of the orphaned elephants came together to create families. Um, but this family that we're looking at, this picture, this was my sister decided that this was an intact family. In other words, they had been together um, the whole time. They had survived somehow all the killing that took place there, and we got to know them pretty well. The, the matriarch, the the leader of this family was easy to identify because she's this one, she's got this crumpled ear. You can see the ear is kind of bent like that. So we knew her and we called her provocadora because she often, you know, would provoke the rest of her family group to charge at us. And she relied on these, are, these females. These are all big females that were in part of this family. The one on the left without tusks, um, we called her Wana and Zo. And this one on the left with the longer tusk, we called her Valente. And the one in the middle, she had those very sharp tusks. We called her pointy tusks. One day, we followed them into one of these fever tree forests. And we kept our distance. When the elephants came towards us, we just backed away. Um, but when they stopped, we stopped. And as the morning wore on, we were able to get closer and closer to them until this Juana and Zoe uh, uh, decided to give us a charge. And she and Valente and pointy tusks and and uh, uh, all came at us, one after another, like a relay race, uh, just cutting us off at every corner. And it was difficult driving through there. You know, it was tall grass, and there was downed logs everywhere, and work out holes and drainage ditches. And it was just, it was nuts. But the charge lasted two and a half minutes, which is an eternity when you're being chased by elephants. But when it was over, my sister Joyce, she saw something that she thought was completely remarkable, and she called it the elephant end zone dance. And what they were doing is they were essentially giving each other high fives, you know, that they had won, they had chased us away. And to her, what it meant that they, this family group was extremely tightly bonded together. And the war really hadn't torn them apart, but it had just brought them together even more than other elephants. While I was there in Gorongosa, um, I saw an amazing thing happen. Because I was there for so many years, I watched the wildlife come back. 
And it was, it was great because not just elephants now, but all these other um, animals that had, had sort of mostly been wiped out in that park had a place to come back to. And uh, their populations are, have grown and grown and grown. A remarkable story. And it's, it shows that nature really can come back if we give it a chance. Um, but I want to tell you now about another place where I worked. And it's all the way across the continent of Africa. This is a long way away from Gorongosa, but it's Mali. And you see it's in red there at the top um, left side of uh, Africa. And um, here in, in Mali is, a, is pretty much a desert. And National Geographic sent me to uh, Mali to film uh, desert elephants. And the desert elephants, they uh, migrate over a huge range in, in search of food and water. It's about 34,000 square kilometers, just in a massive amount of, of terrain that about 500 elephants um, move across this, this in search of food and water. During the dry season, there's only one place that they can go to get water, and it's called Lake Benzena. The thing about Lake Benzena is that it's not just the elephants that come here. It's all the people, the nomadic Touaregs, and their cattle and sheep and goats and camels. And they all come because it's the only water in the whole region that they can get uh, that they can drink from. So the elephants and the cows and the camels have been doing this for centuries. And so they're actually quite okay with this. The people give the elephants a lot of distance. They give the elephants a lot of respect and space. But I was there to film. And in order to make the film that I was trying to do, I needed to get intimate shots, you know, close-ups of elephants. And that meant not just working with long lenses, but actually working in very close proximity to these elephants. And I was, I was having now a lifetime of experience filming elephants. I sort of knew how to do that. The challenge was I couldn't use a vehicle here. All this footage had to be done by working on foot, which is extremely dangerous because the elephants, you know, of course, can kill you quickly. But what I use is the wind. Um, if the wind is blowing my scent away, I can get away with a lot. So the shot that I was really after was when the, when the sun comes up, it comes up in this really strong fireball almost. And I was working hard to get a shot of the elephants walking before the, the rising sun. I had to always know where the wind was, you know, because elephants don't really see that well. But they really smell, and they can tell if they smell your scent, they know where you are, and they can track you down, and they can kill you. Um, so I had to be extremely careful when working this way and always using the wind to my advantage to blow my horrible scent away from them. Are you guys hearing me okay? Yep. Everything looks good, so, Bob. Okay, great. So I finally got this shot. It took me about a month of trying to get this shot of the elephants walking in front of the, the rising sun. And um, if I had been in a car and these elephants were used to cars, it would have been very, very easy. I could have probably gotten in a day, but it took a long, long time. But anyway, as the, um, as the, the dry season progresses, the water dries up, even in this last place for elephants to get water. And um, it really gets quite desperate for the elephants and the cows and, and, and things start dying and it's, it's pretty intense. But we knew that they would soon start on their migration again. All we needed to, uh, was rain. And the rain is what, what causes the, the, the migration to start again. But before the rain comes, there are these massive sandstorms. The wind in front of the rain kicks all this really dry sand up into the air. And it's called a tempet. And so we knew we were going to have to film one of these tempets. And I kept asking this guy, his name's Almedi. Was there going to be a, a tempet? And he said, no, no, no. And then finally, one day, he said, we, 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 grand tempet. We're going to have a big tempet today. So we rushed up to the top of this hill that was near our camp and saw this massive wall of sand coming at us. And it was stretching out across the whole horizon from one side all the way to the other. And we just started filming. We had no idea what it was going to be like when this thing hit us. But it was, it was impressive to see this, this crazy storm coming at us like this. And, uh, and you know, the, the, the thing was moving really, really fast. 
And as it got closer and closer and closer, we started to feel the pressure that was coming in front of it. And then blowing sand and wind started blowing so hard that it was, it was knocking our camera tripods over. We had a lot of um, cameras set up trying to film this thing. And um, I just I remember just grabbing a hold of my camera and just holding it as tight as I could while the, while the thing finally hit and then just rolled over us like a freight train. It was like, you know, you can't even, I can't even describe to you. Everything just went from a beautiful sunny day to, perfect, to total darkness. And we couldn't see a thing. I luckily had a, a flashlight in my pocket from, from filming early in the morning. And um, I broke it out and, and I, you know, I, we, we managed to find our way back to the vehicle and we got the cameras inside. And after about 20 minutes, the darkness just turned into um, this crazy little sort of red light. The, the, then, the, then the winds were still howling and it went like this for maybe about four hours before um, we started to be able to see anything again. It was nuts. But the, the funny thing is when the storm sort of settled, all the people and all the, uh, all the elephants and cows were gone. They, were, they, that, they knew that that storm meant that the rains were coming and they were heading north to where the, where the water would be. And so that was, that was pretty crazy. We kind of brushed all the sand off and, and, and um, went back home and cleaned our cameras. And, and uh, it was pretty an amazing thing. So nowadays, I'm working um, on a different kind of thing. I'm still working with a, a lot of elephants and other kind of animals too. But what we're doing these days is we're, we're sort of following the lives of individual animals. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of hard work. But we, um, we a few years ago, we found this little baby elephant. And, uh, and we decided that we would start following it and its mother and its family and, and uh, film it wherever it went, whatever it did. And it was hard work, but this was the cutest little, little baby. We called him Little Giant in the film. It was for National Geographic. And um, it was really hard work because these elephants are totally wild and they, they, they live and they move over large distances. So what we had to do is we, we'd, um, once we, when we found this little baby elephant and his family, then we would have to stay with them. Um, but of course at night we'd lose them. So the next day we'd have to get up really early in the morning and we'd go on the ridge lines and we'd use our binoculars until we found elephants and then we'd drive straight to the elephants. And if they weren't our family group, then we'd have to go back to a ridge line and start looking again. And we would look, some days we would look, uh, day after day we'd look, we wouldn't find them and then we'd find them. And then we would carry on filming. And so that was a really kind of a challenge, but it was a lot of fun too, because we were able to watch this little baby grow up. And um, on our first um, trip there, we spent three months following this little guy. And that's his family. This is actually um, his, his, the little guy. Um, and then the one he's touching is his, what's called aloe mother, which is really his mother's um, sister. It's like an auntie. And his mother's there on the far left. And the auntie takes care of most, the mother feeds the baby, but he's raised by the whole family. So it was really exciting. So now we take that idea and we're, we're, we're sort of doing the same thing with other animals. Where we, you know, we sort of um, look, we, we locate um, individuals that we're interested in. We think will make good stories or good um, examples of, of, of the kind of behavior that these animals do. And um, we do the same thing. You know, we look for them, and if we find them, we stay with them as long as we can until we lose them. And then if, once we lose them, we, we go out and we start looking again. So it's really hard work because, you know, it's not like if we find just any, say, lion that we're going to film them. We have to, if it's not our lion, if it's not the, the, the one that we've been, uh, that we've decided to tell our story about, we have to go look and keep looking and looking and looking. And sometimes, you know, we're working in, really, really big um, areas. And so trying to find these individual animals is a bit like looking for a needle in a haystack. But um, that's what we like to do. So yeah, I, I, can, um, I can pretty much stop there, I guess, and, and I can let this footage roll if you guys want to watch it, or we can stop it and I can um, take questions or whatever you guys want to do. Yeah, Bob, we'd love to uh, to do some questions. I mean, what you shared with us is so great. The the, the adventures you've been on, uh, what you filmed, uh, especially that that sandstorm, that was incredible. That would have been 
quite an amazing experience. So I, um, I'd i love to introduce some classrooms and we'll start grabbing some of their questions. Um, Jordan, can you- Shall I, will I stop? Sure. Shall I stop the video? Okay, let me, let me stop it there. And uh, um, I'll, I'll get out of this and I'll go back to, um, I'll go back to your, to this, let's see it. Uh, I've got unshare, right? Can yeah, you see me? You just have to click the, the green button one more the time, the button. share screen button. You're back. We gotcha. Okay. All great. right. So, so we're going to meet some classrooms. Jordan's going to keep an eye out on the social media side and we'll make sure we get some off Twitter. We'll get some uh, from the YouTube live page. Let us know who you are uh, and where you're watching from. And now let's jump and meet our first class. So Bob, our first class is uh, Mrs. Groff's group. They're joining us from Santa Ana, California. There's some students from grades nine to grade 12 range. And let me turn your microphone on. Let's go. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's too bad we lost you right in the middle of getting. That's okay, Bob. Through the magic of technology, I can edit that part out later. Okay. All right. Uh, go ahead, California, with your questions. Okay. With questions. So, so come on, that's a question. Go ahead. Please, we're on. How can you tell the difference, like, between the animals? Because, like, yeah, like, those Because they all look the same. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, like, um, it depends on the animal, but, like, elephants are quite easy because, you know, some have tusks and their ears are all shaped differently. Actually, elephant ears is the main way that we uh, identify elephants. They're, their ears are almost like our, our fingerprints. And um, you can, we actually take photographs of just the ear. And if you look very carefully on elephant ears, especially, you know, elephants that are in the wild, they're, they're always ripping and tearing their ears and they're unique. Every single one of them is unique. So. Uh, with elephants and with um, with uh, like cats, lions, and uh, particularly lions, you uh, whisker spots. Like um, if you look at a the you, if you take a photograph of just their whiskers here, they all have a unique whisker. So, and then with uh, spotted cats, you you can actually use their tails because their tails are all unique. The, every single animal. Yeah, um, you know, it's really funny because at first they all look the same, but then when you start um, looking at them carefully, they're incredibly unique. And they're not just unique looking um, the way we all are, but they're also unique behaving the way we all are too. So um, that's one of the reasons why we're trying to film like this nowadays is because we really want people to understand that when you're talking about animals, it's not just a lion. They're all individuals and they're all unique. They're all very specialized at what they do. Some some like to hunt in this way and some like to hunt in another way and some are better at, at um, some are funny and some are serious. You know, it's, it's just like uh, how dogs are, you know, how they're, they're all unique. So yeah, that's what, that's what we're doing there. All right. Great question. Good question. Let's, let's grab another one from our high schoolers. Mm -hmm. um, how does climate change affect animal migration? Oh, I'm sorry. How does climate change affect animal migration? How does climate change affect Oh, God. Uh, yeah, climate change is a big problem for these um, age, ancient uh, migration routes because the whole thing that's going on up in Mali with those elephants is extremely sad, frankly, because it's not just the climate change, but it's also, you know, uh, an area where the, um, uh, you know, the, there's a lot of terrorism there now. Um, Al-Qaeda uh, and ISIS and everything is all involved in, in that and the elephants are being killed and it's a dangerous place to try to study or protect the animals. But at the same time, uh, things are getting hotter and drier and so there's less water and there's not enough natural water left anymore for the people or the elephants. So there's more competition. It's just, a, it's a really scary thing and I think climate change is is a is a is a huge factor. We'll probably lose that migration of elephants. Um, I guess 
um, but so many other migrations and so many other uh, animals that d rely on the climate that we have now. Because, you know, if you think about, we've made these protected areas are all around the world because they're um, important places for wildlife. And most of that has to do with water. Well, if the water dries up, the animals have to go somewhere else, but there's nowhere else protected. So it's, um, it's, it's really, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a really important thing that we try to get a handle on this climate change. We do it everything, everything we can, you know. Um, encourage your, you guys are in California, so you guys are on the right path, but there's a lot of people in our country and around the world that are not buying into this, and we need to try to influence them as much as we can. Okay, thank you for the yeah. questions, and thank you for the great answers, Bob. Um, our next group is Miss Young's class. They are joining us, <clears throat> excuse me, from Emerson, Manitoba in Canada, and they're a grade five group. Let me turn the microphone on. You're on. Um, do you um, know why the light was red in the sandstorm? And also, from the sand, did your camera get damaged or broken in any sort of way? Yeah, those are really good questions. Um, it went totally dark because the sand was so thick and the column of sand was so high, blocked out all the light. But as the storm passed us, passed over, there was so much sand in the air, but as the storm passed over, the, the density of the sand in the air started to lighten up, but it was still um, so much that the only light that could pass through um, was very, uh, very little, and it was affected, I think, by the color of the sand red but i tell you I've, I've it's the only time that i've ever seen anything like that um i know it happens there all, all the time but it's uh really really remarkable um our cameras did take a beating uh the lenses all had to be reserviced some of them never worked again our cameras are are uh, the ones we use are professional cameras that are designed to be serviced so uh, we had to open them up and, and blow all the sand out, and then um, almost all the equipment had to go in for professional um, cleaning and restoration. Not the kind of thing you want to put your camera into uh, if you can avoid it. Thanks for the good question. All right, let's grab another question from Manitoba. Um, is there any animal that's on your wish list that you have? wish list that you want to film but haven't filmed already? Well, yes, I'd like to film a snow leopard. Um, what else haven't I filmed? Uh, I filmed a lot of animals, so I have to think about this. Polar bear, I'd like to see and film a polar bear. Go underwater, but I think I would like to see, uh, um, uh, from, I'd like to see a, a white shark. I don't know. I guess I'm kind of attracted to those kind of animals. So, animals. And I'd be, if somebody asked me to go to some faraway place to film some ugly brown bird, I'd still be happy to go do it. So, um, I, yeah, I, there's anything. I don't really have a wish list so much. It's just, uh, I wish that I could keep doing this forever. How's that? That's a good wish. And we got to get you underwater. All right, let's yeah. meet our next classroom. Um, there we go, Mr. Kaufman's group is joining us from uh, Goshen, Indiana. They're a grade three class. Let me turn your mic on. Stand right in front of me. All right, Ethan, go ahead. Go ahead and speak loud. Um, Ethan, where, is he, where are you gonna move on to next? Oh, wow, that's a good question. So um, I, I, I'm going to Sri Lanka next. Um, Sri Lanka is a, 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 a beautiful country. Uh, it's not far from India, I guess you could say. And it's, um, I'm going there to film elephants and monkeys, macaques. It's going to be a lot of fun, and I'm looking forward to doing that next month, actually. All right, in grade threes, go ahead with another question. Anybody out there? I go ahead and say it. Oh, hi. Do you make Disney movies with Born in China? Say it louder. 
Did you did you do any of the Disney movies like Born in China or any of those? Oh, you know, I've never worked on the Disney movies. Um, that would be a real privilege. I would like to do. I know that Disney Nature has been doing a lot of good stuff, but they haven't called me yet. So let's hope. All right. Thank you, Indiana. Um, Mrs. Bowler's group, I think there were Mrs. Wilson as well, are joining us uh, in Freehold, New Jersey, grade four. Let me turn your microphone on. Okay. You are on. Okay. Um, how can you tell what family you are watching from another? Okay, if it's, you mean like with elephants or other things? Elephants. Okay, well, Elephants are easy to tell the difference in the families because, you know, they all look different. And so we really look at the older elephants in the group, in the family. So we get to know who's the matriarch or the mother. Um, but we, we can also look at uh, the younger uh, ones. Sometimes we can tell the difference. But the older elephants are quite easy to tell the difference because tusks sometimes are broken or one's long and one's short or their ears. It's really, their ears are quite different, but even their body shapes and or their behaviors. But once you start looking at them, it's like, how can you tell your mom from your friend's mom? Because they look different, right? And they sound different. Well, it's the same. And it's the same with all the animals. If you look at them very carefully, you can start to tell who's who. Thank you. Thank you. We have another question. You're welcome. Okay, come all the way girls. Good job. What motivated you to become who you are? <laughs> you know, I think it was adventure. I um I would grew up in Africa, so I didn't have television and I didn't go to movies. But um I always like to I always like to go on big adventures and so this job led, you know, was really, I got into it because of, of going on adventures. And, and uh, I think it's still the case, although I do love the filming and I love the photo photography and um, I love putting the message out there about these animals. So, um, yeah, that's what motivates me now. Okay, great questions and great teamwork. That was some pretty good synchronized questioning from New Jersey. Um, we're going to check in with the classroom. They're watching right now, but I'm not sure if we can hear them. So I believe they're in Lodi, uh, grade six, Miss uh, Raisbeck's class. Let me try and turn your mic on. Um, or you might have to do it on your end, and let's see if we can hear your questions, because we don't have you on camera right now. OK. Well, I'm going to guess that the tech's not cooperating. so. Um, you were able to send me a message um, via the chat sidebar, the blue one. So why don't you send me a couple questions there, and we'll make sure we get um, we get your questions to Bob. And while we wait for those ones, let's meet our next classroom, uh, Mrs. Metcalf in Salem. They're a grade six group, and Bob, these these students have been following you all year, so they are absolutely starstruck to be meeting you and talking to you today. So let me get their <laughs> microphone on. Oh, great. Hi, my name's Elena. My question is, have you seen the tourism in Gorongosa increase since your series was produced? Well, um, the problem in Gorongosa is that um, there was conflict. Uh, you know, there was fighting that started up again. And um, the it's dangerous for people, so at least people, it's uncertain whether they would, people with tourists would be safe there or not. So tourism is not done that well, but I think now the, the conflict is really coming to an end. And I think um, in the meantime, all that meanwhile, the wildlife has been coming back and now there's a, the animals are much easier to see now. And so I think we're going to see tourism really start to take off. And I think that our series was good because it, it did help promote the park and let people know that it was there and, 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 and maybe entice people. Does anybody want to go see it someday? Oh, yeah. 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 
good. Then, then, then that's what we want. We want people to go there when, when it's safe. So I would say that this year or next year, it's going to really start going, going to be great for tourism. All right. Go ahead with another question. Hi, my name is Jasmine. My question is, I know you can't always have your camera with you at all times. Have there been any really great things that you missed filming? Um, you know, even when I have my camera, I miss things because it's really hard to be set up and, and anticipating what's going to happen. And that's the work that I do. I'm constantly learning and constantly getting better because, um, you know, you, you miss lots. And the only way you get anything good is by missing it enough times that you finally anticipate it's going to happen. And that's actually how I learned so much about animals is, um, seeing something happen and then waiting, uh, turn, being set up and ready for it to happen again. Um, I usually have my camera with me, but I've missed plenty of this. And, and, uh, but that's how I learn. Okay. And why don't you guys squeak in one more question? I know uh, you've been following Bob throughout the year. So if you guys have one more, go ahead. Hi, my name is Aiden. My question is, if I wanted to go work in Africa someday, where should I work and why? Yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, I think the, the, the better question is why, and that's because it would be really important. It's a good thing to do, and it's exciting, but it's also, you know, if you go to work in Africa, depending on, you know, there's so many things that you could do, help out over there. My passion is with wildlife. And I think wildlife really is, 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 needs a lot of help. So anything you could do. Now, to get there, where, and that's the big question. Um, you know, there's wildlife still all over Africa. And uh, I think anywhere you go, like with my examples I tried to show you tonight is how different um, things are depending on where you go. Like the elephants in Mozambique were really, af are really f afraid of people. And the elephants in Mali were... We're just trying to survive, and the elephants in Kenya were really relaxed, and it depends on what you what you want, but um, they all need our help. All right, great questions. questions. Um, um, Rebecca's group, uh, I know. Rebecca's group, I know uh, that you're watching. So if you can send in questions via the chat sidebar, um, please do, because we want to make sure that we get. Uh, your classroom's questions in and get your classroom's voice heard. So please do send in those questions. Um, what we'll do now, we visited all our live classrooms, and I know there's more questions. So if um, there's some questions from uh, the classrooms, if you want to send a representative up to the camera, I'll keep my eye out for you, and uh, we'll get your question in when I see uh, someone up in front of the camera. So first come, first serve with Bob. Oh, that was quick. Um, young <laughs> class in Manitoba were ready. They must have been expecting it. So let me turn the mic on. There we go. Have you ever gotten any injuries filming and being on the job? Um, yes, but not because of animals. You know, I think often we we feel, and even I have shown you to, today that these animals are dangerous and everything, but really, um, I think animals are so, uh, even elephants, you know, they're, they're only dangerous to us when we've done things bad to them. And, and I, when I say we, I mean people. Um, uh, most of the animals I film are not dangerous at all, even elephants and lions, um, because we, we respect them and they understand that we respect them and so they're not out to get us. Um, and we also take precautions not to do things silly around them that would get us injured. But I've been injured in, um, by simple things like falling down and hitting my head or whatever. But those are just normal everyday life things. But ne never, never, uh, I've never been injured or, or hurt or in any way by, by animals. All right. Well, that's a good thing. Um, we did have a question come in from our group um, in Lodi, the grade sixes. And they're wondering, Bob, is there something... Uh, or some things that you never forget you always bring with you on an expedition or a filming trip? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, I guess, you know, for cameras, you need to always have uh, your batteries, and you always have to have uh, 
media, um, blank media. So whether that's a tape or uh, in the old days, film, your cards or whatever. So you always have to have those things. Um, I personally think it's good to have food and water because I never know how long I'm going to stay out there and um, I do get hungry and then I'm not very good at my job. So food and water is a good thing. And then it just depends, you know, like sometimes we're out for days on end and I need to have a good place to get sleep. So a tent. Um, I like to be comfortable. So even some kind of a thin pad is nice to have. But, um, you know, just the essentials. I don't need anything um, special out there. I'm quite fond of my electric toothbrush, though. So I usually bring that with me. All right, hygiene's important in the field for sure. Um, I can see, oh, here came one more from the group. Um, what do you feel, oh, okay. What do you feel um, you, oh, I just lost the question. Let me try that again. About, about being away from home. Yeah. Is it the journey or your home? So I think, I think it's a, like, what, what did you feel about being away from home? Yeah, what do what you it feel was? like you give up being away from home? Okay, yep. Oh, yeah, so I, you know, I, I think sometimes, I live in a very nice place. I live in Idaho, in Sun Valley, Idaho. I like to ski, and we have a lot of skiing there, and I like to ride my bike, and there's a lot of good biking there. So, but mainly I miss um, my family, my wife and my dog. And uh, I, uh, I think that's what you give up um, when you go on these kind of long expedition things. You, you sort of have to give up everything that you do when you're not working. Um, but the trade-off is, is well worth it because uh, the work is, it's, um, it's satisfying. And I think it's often, you know, um, maybe uh, helping people understand, you know, what, what we have out there in the world. And so it's well worth it to me. Okay, and I see a grade three in Mr. Kaufman's class in a nice red sweatshirt. <laughs> How many animals do you photograph a year? <laughs> I think that's a hard question to answer because it depends on what animals and where and uh, um, but I, I would say it's more the projects, you know, I, I think it's, um, I mean, I'm, some projects are long and, and they might take up to two years to film and other ones uh, maybe just a couple of weeks. So it, it depends, you know, I, I think that's a very difficult question to answer and I'm still trying to figure that, that out myself. Um, I would say that one of the exciting parts about what I do is you just never know what's going to come next. That's a good job to have, one that keeps you interested and on your toes, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, New Jersey, Mrs. Bowler and Wilson's group. Hi, my name is Hannah. What, con what countries have you been to take pictures of animals? Oh my goodness. Um, I've been almost on, the only continent I haven't been on is um, Antarctica. And in Africa, I've been almost every country. Um, a lot of countries in South America, many places in Europe and all over uh, the US, including Alaska and Hawaii. Um, I've been in, in Asia from, Mo from um, Mongolia and Japan and Thailand and Indonesia and Pacific. So I've been all over the world, really, filming this stuff. And that's great. <laughs> you still got me? I think so. Yep. Yeah. Um, who haven't we visited for round two? Is there something in high school? Is anybody in high school? Oh, yep. Someone's waving. Oh. Hear me? Oh, hey there. Gotcha. Hi. Yeah, got a question. So, uh, besides okay. climate, yeah, besides climate change, in your opinion, what is the biggest threat to animals in Africa, and what can young people do to uh, help out? Oh, that's a great question. Thanks a lot. I think the biggest uh, uh, the biggest threat to wildlife is is, is uh, population growth because you know. Um, in Africa, where wildlife still uh, exists, there is also um, uh, human populations are exploding. People are hungry. 
people um, you typically eat, eat, eat animals because that's what they've always done throughout you know, time. Most of the animals in Africa actually are, are just being eaten. And um, so I think what, 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 what the best thing that, the, the, the best thing that what we can do to help uh, animals in Africa is go visit Africa. Because when we go to Africa and, and pay money to, to see their wildlife, it sends a signal to not just the governments, but the people who are around there that wildlife is valuable besides being food. Um, that's the first thing. If you can't go visit, which is totally understandable, it's not easy to get to Africa and it's expensive. Um, just uh, uh, joining environmental groups or trying to put pressure on our own, continue to um, help governments uh, through programs like USAID, State Department, the US State Department does so much for developing countries, especially in Africa, that you know, takes the pressure off of people so that they don't have to rely only on wildlife to survive. Um, you know, we do a lot of agricultural development and that takes the pressure off of wildlife. So um, there's so much that we can do, um, but that was a great question. I'm so glad you asked it. Okay, I agree. Thank you very much for the question. Let's give last question to Ms. Metcalf's group uh, and your mic is on. Hi, my name is Ashton. My question is, how does it feel to look out over the landscape and feel the presence of the animals and know that you truly belong there? Oh, you know, that's such a good question. It's a great one to end on. You know, because I think that, you know, all of us have that in us. We love to be out in, in nature. We love to be out in open spaces, away from all the noise of the modern world and leaving our phones and computers and everything behind think that all of you have felt that feeling before. Um, it's in our DNA. I mean, we all came from that place. Uh, and it's, it's something that is still very much a part of us. And so there, it doesn't matter who you are, where you came from, um, when you get out in, in, in nature, especially away from any kind of noises and signs of civilization, there's something that is very, very powerful about that. So I encourage you guys all to try to do that as much as you possibly can. And, and I know that a lot of you live in cities and stuff, but there are still parks and places where you can see nature working on its own. So go spend time out there. Get, fall in love with it. Great question to end on and such a great answer, Bob. Thanks so much. Um, let's throw things back to Jordan at Nat Geo headquarters. Yeah, thank you, John. Bob, thank you so much for your great advice and your stories. We all really appreciate it. Um, and to the classrooms out there that are part of this hangout, really awesome questions. You guys did a great job of not only tackling the stuff on the surface, but some of that more under the surface stuff regarding human environment interaction, how we can all play a part to uh, help support wildlife. I want to give some shout outs to Cedar Ridge Elementary School in Minnesota, as well as Miss Kelly's class in Milton, Ontario for asking your questions online. Sorry you couldn't get to them this time. Um, please join again and we would love to loop you into the conversation. Um, for the teachers that were there watching, if you'd like to join an Explorer classroom like this one, please visit natgeoed.org and check out the Explorer classroom profile where we have a schedule of upcoming talks, but also archives of previous talks that you can use and incorporate in your classrooms. Um, once again, thanks to the class for joining and thank you very much, Bob and Joe. Thank All you right, for having thank me. You. Thank you, Jordan. Bob, again, thank you so much. Um, we overcame a little tech hiccup, but that's nothing. Technology, we're used to that. Um, what I'm going to do now, Bob, is turn on the microphones to the classrooms and give them a chance to say goodbye and thank you. Okay. All right, here we go. Microphones coming on. Let's hear it, classrooms. Goodbye and thanks to Bob. <laughs> Always a highlight at the end of the hangout. Bob, thank you so much. Um, we're logging off for today. We'll be looking at the next. Bye.